have a prayer request that you would like to share, or maybe you have a question about the Bible, here's an opportunity for you to share your request or get biblical answers. Stay tuned for a live call-in program entitled Prayer and Answers. Good afternoon. Welcome to another Saturday edition of Prayer and Answers. I hope that you are having a wonderful day and all is well with your soul. It is a beautiful, gorgeous El Paso January afternoon out there. Uh, If you're with us this afternoon, I want to thank you for tuning in. We want to invite you to call in with your prayer requests. And uh, or any Bible questions that you ha- might have. In just a moment, I'll give out the phone number. But first of all, some quick introductions. If you're new to the program, my name is Randy Smith. And with me is my co-host, my normal uh, a partner in this ministry, Dr. Steve Kovac. And Steve, how are you doing today? Doing okay. All right. Phone number here, 915-779-0016. We would love to hear from you. We, uh, we are not... A, uh, a, a consumer-oriented program. This isn't a, just a listen-in, but we, we want the Church of Jesus Christ to be ministering to the Church of Jesus Christ. And so your phone calls, whether they are prayer requests and us praying together, or maybe you have questions or comments about things that are going on in the kingdom, they minister to those who are listening. And so uh, join us in uh, the conversation as we talk about the things of God and and as we try to serve our Lord this afternoon. Again, the phone number is 915-779-0016. Uh, I heard that, uh, Steve, that you went to the Franklin Graham training class, and there was a yes. good number of people there. Yeah, at least 150. Yeah, that was yeah, awesome. It was at Westside Community Church, and um, they have two more. Yeah. And... Um, I'm trying to remember the names of the places, but I think it's on Brennan. Central Vita. Central I think Vita is the name Church, of it. Yeah. yeah, Monday and Tuesday at, night at Central Vita. At 6 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, yeah. Yeah, so if you haven't attended that training, you don't. Uh, you get to learn about uh, the Christian Life and Witness uh, course. You need to. You get to uh, learn about how to witness and, and the basic ideas behind it, and then you uh, get invited to participate with uh, the— uh, front territory yeah. um, and um, uh, be there on uh, March the 3rd at 4 o'clock uh, actually you'd show up a little bit early and then you would uh, be a, a prayer uh, with a counselor called, prayer yeah. counselor yeah. And now you don't have to want to be a prayer counselor in order to go to this training no not at all I love the name of it uh, Christian life and witness uh, you know those two go together Christian life if you if you're living the Christian life you're a witness. Yeah, you know what you know, the, Jesus it, says that well. Yeah. Out and, of the overflow of your heart, yes. your mouth speaks. Yes. And they do a good job of yeah. uh, teaching how to be, how to have the Christian life mm-hmm. and then uh, the natural byproduct yeah. of that, the witnessing. So if you, uh, you can go to God Loves You Tour. Just Google God Loves You Tour. They've got a website that tells you all about it. So let's go to our first phone call. Good afternoon, Minerva, and welcome to Prayer and Answers. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen, uh, pastors. I have a question that's probably very simple, and I just don't really understand um, what you guys can show me. Uh, where, what does it mean in the Bible when it says that we are made in the image of God? I always took it as we're made in a way where we long to be with him, whether we do it or not. I mean, that's well, with a choice that we make, but that's how I see it. But I'm sure that's wrong. So what does that mean? Yeah. Well, we're made in the image of God. Well, that uh, Minerva, you've picked something that has been debated on over and over. And so uh, I'll address part of the question and then, and then, okay. uh, and then have Steve um, address the other part. But I'd like you to uh, listen to Genesis chapter 1, which is where um, those words are first used, Okay. So it says, uh, you know, after God has created uh, the heavens and the earth, after he's created the the animals and the forests and and, and oceans and rivers and uh, stars, and and that's all in in place. Verse 26 of Genesis 1 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, 
And then he immediately says, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it and rule and so forth. So in, for some, uh, um, in some theological circles, it is this issue of dominion. That uh, that that God created man as regents over that portion of His creation, and so uh, um, He He is delegating to man, and it's man's ability to have authority and dominion that is the image of God. In for other circles, it is the fact that it says, "Let us make man in our image." That God is in community; that there is one God, but there are three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and immediately you see that he makes man to be in community with God, but then it's not good for man to be alone, and so he creates woman, and there is this community. So for some, it's that. Uh, for Augustine, I think, if I remember right, it may have not have been Augustine. I think it was Augustine. It was the issue of having choice. Uh, the animals don't have choice. The fish don't have choices. The birds don't have choices. But the, the great image bearer or, or the, the the designation of image bearer was that man has will, and is okay. and in fact the reason why the tree is there is so that man can choose to exit being in community with God if he wants to, and so those are three predominant views. And Steve, I'm sure you've got some others there that you could add in. Yeah. So. The three, so the three major views are called the substance view, the relationship view, and the function view. Uh, the substance view is, is that God uh, created us in his uh, image, and that image is a, um, a, uh, the, uh, this dignity and uh, inherent uh, worth that he gives to us. And so the early church father, Irenaeus, is very famous for saying that. Um, the, the other two uh, flow from the text itself. So it says um, you know, he made them male and female. So uh, the, the second view has to do with what's called a relational approach. He created us male and female. So he created a man, and, and the image has to do with relationship as male and female. And the third view, as Randy said, was it's called the function view or the dominion view. And that's with the function that he has given us to, to rule uh, and have dominion over all the creatures and, and the plants and to uh, be his uh, uh, vice regent, so to speak, and uh, to manage uh, uh, the world around us. And he gives us that responsibility. Um, and so... Um, there, there, there are three views. Now, what happens is, um, as a result of the fall, and this is where he was talking about St. Augustine, um, mm -hmm. uh, because he, we chose to sin, uh, we lost at least part of that image, but it is we are recreated into, into that through the image of Christ. And so the New Testament talks about being restored or recreated uh, in the image of Christ. And so when we receive Christ as our Savior, um, that image-bearing uh, part of us that, that is, has this uh, relational component, particularly with, with God, um, is, is gradually uh, restored. It is restored, and then we can gradually grow into uh, the, the, the image of Christ. So that's a short answer to that question. So I'm going to give you one other Bible verse that I think sheds a lot of light on it and why um, the very first one that Steve talked about was digni a dignity issue, okay? okay? This is from Genesis uh, chapter uh, uh, 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds, sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For human, in the image of God, God has made mankind. I really like that thought of it being an issue of dignity. That God has dignity. And in Psalms chapter 8, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. 
and then he goes down and he says, what is man that you are mindful of him? And then it immediately says, yet you have made him a little bit lower than the heavenly beings and have crowned him with honor and glory. And so it's, it's like God is saying, I am dignified. I am holy. And, and I'm creating this, this creature, but I am going to put some of my dignity on this creature. And the animals are to respect him, and the others are to re- and they are to respect each other as if they are respecting me. And so now when you compare in our fallen condition how absolutely disrespectful we are to one another, and the issue is because uh, our, our adversary um, um, draws us into this defiling of God's dignity by defiling humans. And this is why slavery is such a horrible sin. Okay? Yes. Did you have another question? Uh, well, a praise report, but I mean a praise report um, in the sense that, um, okay, can you explain to me, uh, okay, uh, on tithing? Because I have not been faithful to do that because it's a wrong attitude to have. My ad- and, and people want to tell you what you want to hear. Well, it's not about what I want to hear. It's what, what biblical, what the Bible says. And so, uh, well, because I don't have money to tithe, well, God knows that you don't have, you know, you don't have to. And so God convicted me and put it on my heart that we have to tithe. We should get, uh, get honor him with a 10%, the first fruits. And the pastor has said that when you don't do that, it's like stealing from God. And so it was put on my heart, and so I did it. And another pastor said, well, test him, you know, tell him I'm going to give it, but I would never test God. I would never test God. So I have... Um, been faithful in that like the last two weeks and and I and I want a, a, a praise report just in the sense that I have been abundantly blessed yeah. for being obedient it is amazing to me today I opened my email and I have insurance on my bank but I didn't get it for my car payment and I'm falling behind because I'm still not back at work and I get it well, the bank put it in for you we're also going to pay that one payment and I'm going like what yeah. It's constant. It's constant. So we, and when I was, yeah. We're, we're, Go ahead, all right. So we're kind of mixing some truths here. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, and tomorrow's sermon at your church, Minerva, mm-hmm. is all on this. Okay, great. It's about giving. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to make a couple of statements. Okay. The first one is this. Many pastors teach on tithing, and when you ask them in a secret conversation, they say, well, right. if I don't teach on tithing, we won't have enough money come into the church. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not the parishioner's problem. That's the pastor's problem, that he, that he feels that way. And then he's looking at the parishioners as the provision for the church, when God Almighty is the provision of the pr- provider right. of the church. And what, what we find in scriptures is that as soon as you set the people free, if they truly are new creations and in Christ, you don't have to put a rule of tithing on them. You see Paul trying to tell the Philippians, hey, you guys are giving too much. You see Moses having to tell the children of Israel when they're delivered from Egypt, hey, you guys are giving too much. Mm-hmm. And so when you set the, when you set people free and when they are new creations, you don't have to tell them, uh, um, you guys need to be giving. You have, may have to t- give some instructions on how to give. Okay, but what you're seeing as far as your bank account is not an issue of tithing. It's called the rule of the harvest. If you okay. sow generously, you reap generously. That has nothing to do with tithing. That's the, that it has to do with harvest. And you can go into a great deal of detail on, on tithing, and I want you to remember that the Israelites did not tithe 10%. I believe the number was 23.25% or was it 25? Do you remember? The 20, 28%. 28%. Wow. Yeah. And another thing was they were not a democracy. They were a theocracy. So that, that percentage is basically like the income tax. And right. so uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, I, I assure you that tomorrow's message um, has to do with New Testament giving. Okay. Which is so, it, it's the same thing as when we look at the Sabbath or we look at anything else. The law is so small when compared right. to the New Testament and the freedom and the joy that we have in the New Testament. And it's not that an iota or a, a tittle has been taken away from the law, it's that the law is fulfilled in the new creation, and suddenly you don't even have to tell anybody to give 10%. Right. 
Okay. And they have joy when they give it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Pastor. Great. So I was really happy because, uh, yeah, so I. Let me tell I you. Let, let me. Let me. I want to tell you a story, Minerva. Okay. Okay. This Please happened start. just this last week. All right. Okay. New new people in a church, not not here in El Paso. I just was talking to a pastor about this. And and he also is going to be um, speaking on giving tomorrow. And he got to see this happen this, this last week. Some new people in the church, uh, uh, the, the wife loses her job, uh, then the husband loses his job, and so they're broke. And they've never, never been broke before. And then the car breaks down. And he spends the last two hundred dollars getting a car towed. Now he has no money for groceries for for him and his his children, and they've never been in this place before. And so, um, and he won't ask for help. And so the pastor finds out about this, and so the pastor says, "Let me take you to the grocery store and let's get some groceries." So they go to the grocery store, and the guy the guy um, picks up like the smallest package of chicken, and the pastor's going, you, "You've got a family of five, and so he grabs the biggest package of chicken, and the guy's going, "You're killing me. I don't want to be a beggar." And the pastor's going, "No, no, this is how it works." And he goes, "What kind of cheese do you need? you know?" And he, he said, "Well, we usually get the shredded, and so the pastor goes by the biggest package of shredded and cheese and 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 the, this, this husband is just going, "You're killing me i I." This is just killing me. Well, there's a hilarity to this. Do you see, when it says God loves a cheerful giver, the pastor just keeps laughing and he goes, you know what your problem is? You won't share your need. You're stingy with your need. You won't let the church love you and take care of you until you're over this burden. And the church just wants to you start to see New Testament giving taking place here. And Pastor, you know what? I live that myself because, right. as as you know, I had to ask for help, and my and I didn't want to. My fiancé says, well, it's one of two things. Either it's pride or this, if you really need it. And what you do, because you're not working, he goes. And so then um, I reached out to um, somebody in the church, and they said I had to speak to somebody. And I didn't even have to. He had reached out, and, and then they met with me, and I was embarrassed it's not sure. necessarily by just being embarrassed that there's so many people that need and i feel um just embarrassed to even yes. ask for assistance but it was a blessing to be helpful and it also made me realize that just as i was helped you know god is great and he will provide like the bible says and my grandpa was big on that and, yeah, and so, i've seen it now and now you know, I, I, since yeah. Jesus says these words, freely you've received, so freely give. So what happens, Minerva, is instead of Amen. you having to look at it and go, where do I put this decimal point? You're free and you go, I, they helped me so much. Right. Amen. And now the Lord is Amen. blessing me. I, I want to put money there so that they can help the next Amen. person. And exactly. I just want to close with one more thing with on this topic. So um, I I know of a of a young lady from Korea. Her name is Grace, and she married a very poor soldier, and they had two children, and they were living in El Paso. And she came to meet Jesus, and she received right. salvation. And right. she didn't have two pennies to rub together for many many years. And mm -hmm. the only thing she had to give, I mean, they did tithe, okay? They did mm -hmm. tithe because they wanted to. They knew the bi biblical principle. And it wasn't right. a law, it was just this is just a, a biblical principle. But right. then she would she would she had one child on her back and one in a stroller and one walking next to her and she would walk down to the church and clean the church. Right. And she would pray, God, is there ever going to come a day where we get to give generously like people are giving to us. That's New Testament attitude. And if Amen. a church has that, they never have to worry about running out of money. Amen. And that's, Amen. The way, that's the way God wants us to be, that it's from the heart. Okay? Exactly. Okay, pastors, I took up time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless Wait, wait. I have to tell okay, you the joke. Job. No, I don't. was like, no, <laughs> yes, please do. I didn't want to make speech work. All right. Go right ahead. I'm ready. All right. <laughs> so, um, so this uh, bishop is invited to come and, at, and, and preach at, at one of the parishes. And when he gets there, there's only three people there for the sermon. And he looks at the vicar and he goes, did you tell them I was coming? And the vicar said, 
No, but evidently news got out anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, 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 thank you for the joke. All right. Bye, Minerva. All right. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Steve. See, he thinks that's funny. <laughs> I do. Yeah. You know, the way you you said that, you sound very much like a radio personality that that's um, on one of the big stations. So. I do. All right. Yes, I do. I'm sitting here just giggling because I, th- I think that's very funny. Okay. The phone number, 915-779-0016. And uh, we will take a break to give Kenny a chance to pray for phone calls again. And we would love to hear from you on Prayer and Answers. And you saw it was so easy with Minerva. Give us a call and join the conversation. We'll be back in just a moment. This is John MacArthur with another edition of Portraits of Grace. Both Abraham and Rahab are great illustrations of sacrificial faith because they valued their faith in God above everything else. Both were willing to sacrifice what mattered most to them, For Abraham, it was his son Isaac. For Rahab, it was her own life. Their obedience in the face of such great sacrifice proved the genuineness of their faith. You see, the acid test of your faith is whether it produces obedience. No matter what you claim, if obedience doesn't characterize your life, obedience to God's Word, your faith is dead, not living. I pray that you're rejoicing in the confidence that your faith is real. This is John MacArthur. Looking forward to bringing you more Portraits of Grace. This is Max Lucado. A person can be religious and yet lost. Attending church won't make you God's child. You must accept His offer. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. It makes no sense to seek your God-given strength until you trust in His. It's in Christ we find out who we are and what we are living for. Take a few moments and talk to God. Whether you are making a decision or reaffirming an earlier one, talk to your Maker about your eternal life. You might find this prayer helpful. Emmanuel, you are with me. You became a person and took on my flesh You became my Savior and took on my sin. I accept your gift. I receive you as my Lord, Savior, and friend. And because of you, I'll never be alone again. This is Max Locato. And we are back with more prayer and answers. For those of you who didn't know it, I I say Dr. Steve Kovac because Steve has a doctorate. And he's also uh, a teacher at Howard Payne University as well as a uh, 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 professor, teacher of philosophy, philosophy. At, um, at Community College in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And so uh, one of the classes that Steve is teaching at Howard Payne is on the New Testament. Is that it, like a, a New Testament overview, a survey yeah. of the New Testament, so a quick I'm, survey of the whole New Testament? Yeah, that's one of them. And the other one I'm also teaching this semester is The Life and Teachings of Jesus. And then one more, which is yeah. the Doctrine of the Trinity. Right, and then one more. Oh my! Um, church history. Okay, and well, then I teach a, philosophy at community you've got college. Got a full plate. Yes. So, um, one of the things that uh, um, I, I just want to in, encourage, if you're listening and you and you feel like God is calling you uh, to minister, uh, Howard Payne is a great place to go and get and get equipped. Um, it is possible to be a minister without uh, um, having a formal education. However, even if you, you you should be constantly studying and learning, and um, Howard Payne is a wonderful place to take some more classes. Um, a- after I became a pastor is when I really started uh, taking different classes and and then finding other things to study. So uh, it's. It's it's a it's a good place to go. Now, one of the things that um, when we talk about the doctrine of the Trinity, that's an entire semester. Yes. On one doctrine. Yes. And uh, there's nowhere in the Bible that says God is three persons in one God. Right. And so a lot of people challenge the doctrine of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. In fact, most cults. 
um, in one way or another, challenge uh, the person of Jesus and who he is. And so um, do you want to just take a moment and talk about how we go from there's no ver- there's no single verse that says God is three persons and one God. And yet this is the f- this this foundational doctrine sure. that all Christians must believe. OK, so what I the approach that I take and there's all sorts of different approaches is we say that the by bi- the uh, Dr. Trinity is in the Bible, but it's, it doesn't give you a direct verse or something that tells you that you have to work through it. So I here's how we start. The first thing we say is that the Old Testament doesn't really reveal it in any direct way. Um, and so the way you start is uh, the the two events that that fully reveal uh, the persons of the Trinity. And those two events are the incarnation or Jesus uh, becoming man and being fully God. We call that the the doctrine of the incarnation, and that's all over the New Testament. And then we talk about the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. And so you begin with the event. Okay? So now you have the events that define the nature of the persons of the of the Son and the Spirit. And then you go to what we call a new covenant uh, uh, explanation. Uh, The technical term we use is the attestation of it uh, throughout the New Testament that affirms the person of Christ and the person of the Spirit as God and the person of Christ as fully human and fully God. And you work through those texts and see the different ways that it's explained. And then you can go back to the Old Testament and see some shadows see some uh, indirect images uh, of of those ideas um, uh, in in the so we we used for example uh, just today Genesis 1 let us uh, make man in our own image there's a plural it could be a plural of majesty but it, it, it is probably an indirect reference to the to the the Trinitarian reality of God the Father God the Son God the Spirit all the way um, who have existed from eternity and have had that same nature and are all uh, consisting of the same nature and have all been in community uh, for, um, for eternity. And uh, the explanations of how there's, there's hints and shadows in the Old Testament. So that's, that's the approach we take. Yeah. Um, there's other approaches that you can take, but um, I always challenge people to say, you know, they tell me I can prove uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. And I said, well, you go ahead and try that. Yes. <laughs> and, and so um, but the, but then we go from there and talk about how the early church worked through struggles of false teachings. Yes. And through the false teachings, we're able to affirm from the scriptures. They always affirm them from the scriptures. Um, the truth of of, of God, uh, three persons one nature. And the way that, that I look at it, um, very much like like science, okay, what I mean by that is man uh, doesn't invent gravity, man discovers gravity. Gravity is there and then man discovers it. Right. I think of uh, Maxwell and his four laws of electromagnetic magnetism. He didn't invent, he didn't make those four laws. He discovers this is how the universe functions. This is this is how light works. This is how electricity works. And it's the same way with the Trinity. Man did not invent the Trinity. Man discovers because God um, reveals himself. Revelation is progressive. Yeah, and, but it, even and it's though, God who reveals it. Yes, as, as, at, as he wants. Yes. At the time that he wants. But even when we say that you you uh, you don't find it in the Old Testament, there's hints right. all over the place. I'm just going to give you... Uh, so, so God sets these hints up, and you're just sitting there going, what does this mean? And then Jesus Christ comes, and he's the fuller, he's the revealer of of these things. And then he, his incarnation pulls back the curtain, and you see what it is. So this is from Genesis chapter 19. This is when Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. And this, this passage of Scripture um, really kills Jehovah Witnesses, okay? It says... Uh, then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Now, of course, in the Old Testament, the first thing that the Israelites are told that they're supposed to tell all the nations is there is one God. 
Now, the, the word Lord, uh, it's, it's, it's his name. Yes. Then Yahweh rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur from Yahweh in the heavens. And you see, just like it is in the New Testament, here is the Lord on earth and here is the Lord in heaven and heaven's opening and the voice of God coming out of the heavens saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So it's all through the scriptures. It's just not revealed and explained until Jesus comes and, uh, and his incarnation himself. begins. Uh, yeah, you begin to see it there. Yeah. And then, of course, when the he Spirit sends comes. the Holy Spirit, now you have the fullness of it. So uh, just so you all know that this is not an invention of man, but it is a revelation from God. And a lot of times people say, well, you know, how can that be? Well, it's God. He is God. And so if you don't believe in revelation then you believe in yourself well, yes. and you believe in your own reason. Yes. And uh, Which so is fine where does that, and so uh, you don't leave any room for God Yeah. and uh, God reveals himself. Yeah. And uh, he, he, that's how we get saved because so we God can, reveals himself. And we can come back to that thought in just a moment, but let's go to our telephones. Good afternoon. This is Randy. Welcome to prayer and answers. Hi. Um, I just wanted to request prayer. Okay. I and, think, can you tell no. me, can you pronounce your name for me? I didn't want to even try. Zulema. Okay, Zulema. Zulema. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, yes, I wanted to request prayer because I've been under a lot of attack. Um, I'm recently uh, taking care of a, of a family member, a child, a, a baby, um, and he has been under severe conditions of abuse. Mm. And... Um, Mm. I, it's just like an ongoing progress of him having, uh, it's not noticeable, but just because of the neglect yeah. and also um, uh, the abuse, the, the signs keep turning out. Yes. And it is pretty hard on me, but I know the Lord is fortifying me. But I just need a little more yeah. fortification, the- wisdom. And also um, the fact that I feel like the enemy is not only against me or him, but against my family, against um, the fact that I'm taking care of him and I do want custody for him, um, which is more likely to be there. But there's opposition um, kind of like with family members, uh, my 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 side of the family, my husband's side of the family, because they don't know the whole story. And um, I don't know why. Um, I just pray that God gives me insight and discernment on how to do that. And and favor, especially favor, because the baby is very happy. Thank God. He's very happy. He's doing really good. And and we're getting very, very close. But I just know that he, he's he been under a lot. And um, I'm just praying that that all of what he has, um, little by little, gets removed. All right. So, over all the yeah, trauma. Let, me, let me pause you there and ask you a couple of questions, okay? Because okay. The, what, what we're talking about right now is, is, is very, very important, okay? So... Just let me ask a couple of questions. The first one is this. Zulema, it sounds to me, but I don't want to assume, it sounds to me like at some point in your life, you turned to Jesus and trusted him as your Savior. Is this correct? Yes, correct. All right. Now, I need you to listen very, very closely, okay? Okay. One of the things that Steve and I will bump into as ministers is we will bump into adult people who were abused as children. Yes. And some of them will be um, demon-possessed or oppressed. Some of them will have such horrible mental illnesses. Some of them will be just like the walking wounded, never able to have a relationship with other people, and they don't even know why. Many will go into alcoholism and drug addiction. Because what Satan does to a child when they're in that vulnerable time, he, he brings such destruction. But then Zulema... God brings somebody like you into that child's life. 
then you're going to be able to heal. And if, if, you, if you do the things that I tell you to do right now, when this child grows up, this child's going to be whole and healthy and not, Steve and I won't be bumping into him down the road as a, as a total mess. Yes, I know. All right, so now listen, all right? In the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about God providing a highway of holiness. And it's a highway where people can walk and where the lions can't attack them. And what he's talking about is you and I. That, Zulema, if you will live a life of holiness, if you'll devote yourself totally to being a servant of God and you keep it, you guard your own life and you keep sin out of your life and you quickly confess whenever you fall into sin and you watch very carefully the things that you that you want that you see on TV and so forth you don't allow yourself to be polluted that holiness is just going to be all over you and there's okay. going to be such power in this child's life does that make sense yes you are I'm the making... highway of holiness for this little this little boy to walk on and he'll be brought to his heavenly father and he'll be healed do you hear what i'm saying Yes. So I want to tell you some things that you need to do for the rest of your life. Do you, are you really willing to take on this job and raise this child like that? You said you want custody, right? Yes. Uh, yes, I am willing. Yeah. So first of all, you're going to make Jesus Christ the center of your life. He's the reason why you live. And the second thing is, I want you to surround yourself with a church family. And you need to be in your word every day. And then you need to be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and sin will quench that power in your life. So you're going to have to guard yourself closely against sin. And you're going to have to surround yourself with prayer, which is why you called in today, right? Yes. And we are going to pray for you. But I want you to remember to surround yourself with prayer. You're going to need please, a church family or family members, and you'll just keep saying, pray for me. Will you pray for me? Please pray for me. All right? Because God, what, what Satan meant for harm, now God has sent you into this child's life for good. That's a pretty big responsibility, right? But, but I know it was God calling. Yes. It was. And there's no... It was all put together in great precision like yes. there was no it, it's not a burden it's right. just he's there yeah. you know how can I explain it like when I thought oh how can it be how is it gonna happen it's not it doesn't become impossible it actually becomes possible and I always ask the Lord if you want this for me mm -hmm. if it is your will mm -hmm. let it be done and with with that, he has no burden to right, right. To the blessing. It become it will be a joy, and he so will he will empower he has, you, and he'll walk with you. That. Yeah, he has been faithful. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to ask Steve to pray for you, okay? And I'm going to ask all of our listeners. There is nothing more important than this ministry right now, Zulema. And so I'm going to okay. ask all of our listeners if you would just follow Steve and pray along with Steve for this little boy. And for this daughter of Christ, who is who God has called to minister, go ahead, Steve. Yes, Lord. Um, so, and we pray uh, because uh, you love the little children, and uh, you want them to be protected, and um, and let them come to you. So, Lord, often there are hindrances, and many times. These hindrances can occur in their childhood when there is abuse and neglect and uh, the damage that is, is done in, little, in the little ones. And so, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you would bring healing, even though she's just a little baby, that you would bring healing to his little mind and heart, that you would work in his life and help them to to see Zulema and uh, help to see the love that uh, uh, loving um, uh, people who take care of us 
and uh, to, to be nurtured and grown and uh, to have a good environment in which to grow up. And, you know, Lord, it sounds like there might be a court battle here. So we want to pray that you would uh, oversee that and overcome uh, any opposition to having uh, uh, an adoption or a custody uh, based on uh, what is best for the child. And uh, we'll nurture and grow them in relationship to you and to uh, do battle with the enemy uh, in this in this time, if that were to occur. And give Zuglima grace and mercy. Help her to walk with you, as Randy has, has suggested and, and asked. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless and guide this little child. And bless Zuglima and help her to feel your presence as as uh, she expresses the love of Jesus uh, in her life that overflows into the little baby. And we just give that to you, Lord. We ask for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And remember that you are the God who heals. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Zulema, you call back any time, and we'll keep praying for you. Prayer actually makes a difference, okay? So Thank you, you, Pastor. You keep us posted, all right? Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. God bless you. Bye. Got about 20 minutes left here, a little less than 20 minutes. And uh, this has been a topic that has been brought to me all week long, what Zulema just brought. So I know that the Lord is moving right now. We learn from Henry Blackaby that whenever we see God moving, we just set our agendas aside and we, we join him in his work. So it is very possible right now that you might be listening and saying, I need prayer. I want to invite you to call in. Maybe you are listening and, and, and you're involved in the life of someone who as a child had been uh, abused. I want you to call in and just and just uh, give us a name, and we will we will pray. The, night, the phone number is 915-779-0016. I want to take a break, just um, give folks a chance to call in, but I think that God is moving right now because this topic has been coming up all week long, and maybe you're the one that needs uh, prayer. Uh, while we take this break, you call in. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome to the Mercy Minute from MercyShips.org. Carlos was six years old when he first knew he wanted to be a missionary. As he grew, he volunteered in missions among the homeless and poor communities. Eventually, Carlos received a degree in biomedical engineering in Brazil. When he heard about Mercy Ships and the opportunity to combine his education along with his passion for mission and helping those in need, Carlos got on board. Carlos found his role was not just maintaining equipment on the Mercy Ship. Once a month, Carlos went to fix medical equipment in local hospitals. Seeing this need grow, Carlos had an idea to train local medical staff to maintain their own equipment. Thus began a program where biomedical and laboratory technicians would receive training both on board and in local hospitals. It has always been the heart of Mercy Ships to train local professionals to help strengthen and grow the medical systems in the countries where we serve. See how your partnership changes lives at mercyships.org. It's Crazy Money Day. Hey, I'm Chuck Bentley with the Crown Money Minute. An Ohio woman developed a unique business model for bridal gowns, and she's making good money. She buys discounted last season samples from major retailers. Then she turns around and sells them locally. This not only helps customers save a lot of money, but allows retailers to recoup some of their costs. This entrepreneur opened Formality Bridal in 2018. Word of mouth and social media marketing helped the company become profitable in just one year. She opened another shop in Erie, Pennsylvania in 2023. The two locations could bring in a combined $1 million of revenue this year. Faithful stewardship, creativity, and hard work have paid off. For help setting your financial priorities, download our money map at crown.org. That's crown.org. And we are back with more prayer and answers. Uh, I had a couple of prayer requests that came in before the uh, program started, and so uh, I'll take the first one, and Steve, I'll have you take the second one. 
Um, right before the program started, George called in and asked for prayer for his health and his finances, and those two can definitely go together, as we all know. Bad health sometimes can really put a crimp in the finances. So uh, let's take a moment and pray for George. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you as you have instructed us, and we bring our brother's burden to you. Um, Father, I, I do not have, not have any idea what his health issues are, but I know that in your kingdom, it's a realm of blessing. And Father, uh, whatever the enemy has touched and has been stealing and destroying, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would reverse that and you would bring health and you would bring prosperity to George so that those around him will be able to hear him give a testimony that you heard his cry, his cry and you answered his prayer and they will see the signs and wonders in his life and be able to give you glory and praise and perhaps someone will come to put their trust in you as well. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And then uh, um, we have a prayer request from the radio station here. It just simply says that there's plumbing problems. And so I don't know what those pro problems are. I know last week Kenny had talked to us a little bit about it, and uh, uh, this is an old place. <laughs> so, um, and some of you may, uh, if you're old, you may have plumbing problems yourself, and so you know what happens with that. So, uh, Steve, would you uh, would you pray for the station's plumbing problems? Sure. So, Lord, uh, uh, this is a station that relies on you. This is a station that relies on the giving of God's people. And this is a station that relies on your grace to sustain itself and with the provision that you've given it. And so we pray, Lord, that uh, all these different problems that have arisen in the last few weeks with the plumbing, that you would help it to, to help there to be a permanent fix, that you would uh, bring uh, uh, provision, uh, either in terms of a plumber or uh, finances, uh, to to pay for it, and that you would give whoever is fixing it wisdom uh, to know how to navigate the the issues and and resolve the plumbing problems, so that um, they would not continue to be a burden to the station. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, continue to anoint and guide this station, and that you would uh, put your loving arms around it and uh, help help it to see your hand and and bringing. Uh, a solution to this problem, and then as we as we, they go into the future, to continue to provide in new and great ways, uh, according to your great provision and grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Um, so, Steve, you heard me talking to Zulema about holiness, um, and the Lord commands us to be holy as He is holy. Yeah. So that's that's in Isaiah, right? And it's somewhere in the 30s, Isaiah 35. I can't I can't remember right yeah. now about the highway of holiness is what I was quoting. I don't I don't it's remember. It's in two places. Yeah, I was reading it this morning. Okay, yeah. But um, first of all, uh, Steve, what what does that mean for us as believers to live a holy life? And then second, um, do you think you know on average? Are, are we fulfilling that? Um, uh, the, just the the average person attending church in America. Are we missing it? What what what? If we are missing it, what's the hampering? So there's three questions. What does it mean to be holy? Are we are we holy uh, indeed, as well as in declaration? And and what hampers holiness? Okay. Um, so the text is found in Isaiah 35. Okay. And that's one of the two places I don't remember the second place. Um, and so it deals with, with God coming and returning uh, from the, the, and blessing the nation of Israel after their exile and bringing uh, great abundance. And it, it has a, a picture there uh, of a future time. Um, and um, so Isaiah 35, 8 uh, picks up on the, the different abundance that he promises and it says, and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Uh, no lion shall be there, no any ravenous beast who comes upon it. They shall be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. 
And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sigh, sighing shall flee away. And the other one is Isaiah chapter 19. 19, okay. And, and oh. there it's talking about Egypt and Assyria and he's talking about he will, he will break Egypt and he will cause Egypt to come and they'll know God also and there will be this, the three and it says there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to the Assyrians. And the Assyrians will worship together. And that day Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handwork, and Israel, my inheritance. And, you know, you remember Jesus saying, I, I, have, I have sheep from other flock of another flock. And this great joining together of the, uh, the, uh, the Gentiles. In, uh, in Jesus Christ um, to to Israel and there's just one flock then and so um, and but then he calls that flock those who put their trust in Jesus he calls them to be holy right so what so, is that issue so uh, let me try to run it through in another analogy from Isaiah since we're mm -hmm. working through that so in Isaiah chapter 40 we, we, we talk about uh, uh, the prophecy concerning John the Baptist and from the New Testament that comes from here. And it says, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And so when John the Baptist came, he gave us the way of the Lord and, and the pathway, the pathway begins with what? Repentance. Because that's the first thing he said, repent, for right. the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of, and here is this highway that he's talking about. Right. This highway he's preparing for us to walk with, uh, walk into the presence of God and walk with God. Yes. And so to me, it's an analogy, but it's yes. a high, it, it, it is a pathway. Yeah. And so the pathway begins with, with, with God convicting us and helping us to see our sin. And uh, this pathway that John the Baptist uh, prepared and as he prepared the way for the Lord and he brings the baptism of the spirit and 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 uh, uh, that will transform us as, as we walk with him and uh, trust him. But it begins with repentance. So we saw this break out in Brownville at, at Howard Payne Brown University, Brownwood yeah. at Howard Payne University. When, when the revival broke out there, repentance was the first thing that happened. That's right. There was four young men, students. Uh, now the, the, the revival had already broken out in the town, but now it went to the university itself. That's, that's right. And uh, uh, there were four young men that people looked up to. And in a meeting, one of those men stood up and confessed in front of the whole meeting that he was struggling with pornography. And then the other three did as well. And the... Uh, the leader of the revival, uh, John, I can't remember his last, eight, eighth, I can't remember. Anyway, it, it just suddenly broke out. It broke out with repentance first. Mm -hmm. And and he just said for, everybody was shocked because everybody looked at these four men as the pillar, the, 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 the model of Christianity in their school. And I, and I think this is something that I want to bring out. There's no difference today. Most of the models of Christianity are about as compromised as these four guys are. The, the church of Jesus Christ today is extremely compromised in sin. And holiness is when we repent of that and, and we're purged from that sin. And so they, he just said, y you, you guys go over here and start praying. Well, he said, maybe there's somebody else. And Steve, the whole auditorium of men started, young men started coming. And then when an older man came and he was a pastor, but he was the father of one of those men. And he confessed and said, you know what? I have pornography and lust in my life. And I've been a horrible father, a role model to my son. And, and the pastor said, maybe there are adult men that need to. And so all of a sudden the adult men were there repenting. And then one of the women, one of the young ladies stood up and said, actually, the truth is, you're just 
ministering to men, but we deal with lust. And she stood and said, I'd like to apologize to all of the men for the way that I've been dressing and the thoughts and the sin in my life. And he said, well, you go over to the piano and everybody, and suddenly the women were bawling and moving to the piano. And this revival went on 24 hours of just repenting of sin. Well, the point is, it's when they became holy that then the lost world could see through their holiness the Savior, Jesus Christ, and lost people started getting saved. Holiness is not an option. Holiness is what is commanded of us. And if we're compromised with sin, you may wink and nod at it, but the truth is we're the problem. We're the source of the problem instead of being that highway of holiness that the gospel can travel across to reach the Egyptians and the Assyrians in that metaphorical way of speaking. Yeah. And then the blessings that in chapter 35 that he gives to the exiles. Yes. Um, and uh, because um, there is no unclean thing. Yes. And so they had to respond to, to God's work. And this is why I was asking Zulema, would you please commit yourself to holiness so that she can be a tool that God can use in this in this child's life as the child begins to grow? Um, her, her being holy, not only in word that God declares her holy, but in deed that she, that she watches a, a, for sin and she lives a holy life. Um, that's what's needed, and that's what's needed by all of God's children. And unfortunately, it's been a long, long time since the people of God have been called out and uh, and 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 told, "Hey, uh, your Lord does not does not accept this offering you're bringing, this life that you're bringing that is compromised with the things of the world." And yeah. so, so, so this kind of happened uh, at Asbury. A, uh, a little bit there too, yeah. yeah. For about a hundred hours, yeah, right. Um, and and they had to cut it off at some point when when there was worship. And part of it was repentance, uh, and and part of it was was focused on uh, the invitation for God to do great work. And and they were praying together and confessing their sins among one another. And it was a student led uh, revival, right. right. And repentance is what is needed. And the funny thing is, is if you go and talk to any of those people that suddenly stood up and repented and said and asked them later, Do, are you, you know, are you really sad that you had to give up this pornography and these other sins? They would tell you, no, I am so, so happy to be free. Uh uh, uh Many are just drinking out of out of out of drinking sewage. And because everybody's drinking sewage, they think, well, this is this is what there is. And when you finally turn from that and start drinking the living water that comes from God, you never want to go back to sit drinking uh, from from the sewage. And so I just I want to to the to the believers. Would you take a look at your life? God, God sees everything, everything that you're doing. Would you just would you just repent of it? And say, God, I am so sorry that I do these sins. And I, I'm, I'm asking you, first of all, I'm confessing and I'm asking you uh, to free me. And then what you need to also know that confessing um, out loud <laughs> frequently is what's needed. Confess your sins to one another, the scriptures say. And so um, anyway, that's all the time that we have uh, today are we out of time, Kenny? Yeah, it's time to wrap this up. So I want to thank our callers for calling in, and if the Lord tarries, we'll be back with more prayer and answers next Saturday. Thank you for listening to Prayer and Answers presented each Saturday afternoon at one thirty. Tune in again next week at this same time for Prayer and Answers. Jesus is the way.